Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the creative director of the New York Times live conversation series, Times Talks. For over 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of art, politics, social justice, film, theater, and music. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Grammy, Tony, and Emmy-nominated singer, songwriter, and actress, Sarah Bareilles. Her upcoming album, entitled Admits the Chaos, out on April 5th, spotlights Bareilles' voice as a singer and storyteller like never before. After Bareilles discusses her creative process and latest collaboration with legendary Academy Award-winning producer T-Bone Burnett, you'll all be treated to a special performance with one of today's most prolific and multi-dimensional stage, screen, and musical artists. Moderating tonight's conversation is John Perales, the chief popular music critic at the New York Times for over 30 years. Before we begin our program, a quick word from our presenting sponsor, City. <laughs> Without further ado, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our rhyming pair tonight, John Pirellis and Sarah Bareilles. It, 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 this, look, this looks like a good crowd. Um, Sarah, I'm so happy to have you here. I'm so um, glad we rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> That's never happened before. <laughs> there you go. Um, well, you have a new album, um, Amidst the Chaos. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like it's actually amidst the multitasking. But, <laughs> um, but um, you hooked up with Tibo and Burnett, who is one of the great producers of our era. Um, but how did it come about? I mean, it, it, it's... How did it get started? Well, um, actually, the woman who introduced me is here tonight. She's a dear friend, and she's my collaborator on Waitress, Jesse yes. Nelson. And um, she and T-Bone and T-Bone's wife, Callie, have been friends for a long time. So as I was sort of turning my sights back towards making the record, she suggested, you know, maybe T-Bone would produce a song on the new record. And he's been on my bucket list since I was like 18 years old along on like a yellow legal pad piece of paper with like, write some funky shit and, <laughs> and like record songs with horns on, like, like weird goals, but then also T-Bone Burnett. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm gonna tell him that part of the story. Um, but he, uh, when I shared some of the material, he wrote back and said, I think I would rather do a, a whole record. So, I, you know, that was a no brainer. So I, I have Jesse to thank for that. So thanks, oh, that's Jess. Great. <laughs> Huh. Um, did, um, so you had half of it written? I had a handful of songs that were kind of in that questionable sort of first, um, it's like the first chapter of putting the record together to me, which is you're just kind of culling together what has appeared over the last handful of months. And then usually in my process, at least, there's one or two songs that kind of um, emerge as the centerpieces of the record. and and. Um, Armor was one of those, and, and T-Bone really responded to that song as well. So, um, yeah, it wasn't all the way written, but it, it got there quickly. So was it, because you, you had to, you switched gears to write Waitress. Yeah. And to write your book. Um, the, um, so it had been a while between writing as Sarah. Totally. I've been writing almost exclusively about pi for the last, <laughs> for the last like, six years. I almost talk exclusively about pi. Like, I realize in interviews where people are asking me about myself again, I'm like, wow, I'm really not used to talking about anything but waitress. <laughs> like, would you like to talk about waitress? I'm really good at that now. You <laughs> um, probably will. <laughs> yeah. No, I love, I actually really love talking about waitress. But yeah, it had been a long time. And I think, to be totally frank, the, the pivotal moment for me as a songwriter was um, the election and, and going through what felt like um, sort of this uh, awakening for me and I think for so many other people. And, um, you know, the, the title of the record 
is a, is a macro and a micro statement about sort of taking in what feels like it's happening on, on, on the grand scale, but also my life has been sort of chaotic over the last handful of years. But the turning point for me, I think, was the election. And, and armor popped out first? Yeah, shockingly, that one yeah. came out <laughs> like a cannon. <laughs> um, I came back from the Women's March. I went for, you know, I'm almost 40. I turned 40 this year. And I, thank you. <laughs> I didn't die yet. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, I, I am a sort of a new, a fledgling activist. And I, I think, you know, to come to a place in my life at this stage where I realized how much I've taken for granted personally. I mean, I've always been someone who's been very passionate about the world and, and um, causes that really matter to me, but I think I'm at a new place where I realize that my level of engagement has to increase. And um, so I made my mini pilgrimage to, the, to DC for the Women's March, and it was really life-changing and, and so profound to stand among, did any of you march? <laughs> yes. I found it to be miraculous. Um, I mean, just the, the sensation of standing amongst hundreds of thousands of people in a totally peaceful, gentle wave of energy, of, of humanity. That was really unforgettable. And it took you back to Eve. Yeah, exactly. So I really, I've started to really think about, you know, what it feels like to be a woman and those, and dismantling some of those tropes that kind of just exist without thinking about it. I mean, I really, I did go back to the Adam and Eve story and I was like, Wait a minute. <laughs> he was there too. <laughs> um, so it's. <laughs> I'm very eloquent. <laughs> um, and yeah, so I just, you know, I think a lot about young women. I, it's always been probably the demographic I'm the most passionate about. I have um, a younger sister and I have young nieces, and I think about the things I would have loved to hear when I was a young woman. And I love that the next generation is getting to just be allowed to question things. And even if we're sort of clumsy about it right now, at least we're asking these bigger questions. And you know, I think the goal is really pure. Yeah, no, it, it, but you, you were, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, you, you wrote King of, King of Anything before the term mansplaining was. <laughs> was popular. I mean, you, but you've been on, this, on yeah. this for a while. I've been a stubborn little asshole my whole, whole life. <laughs> yeah. good, good on yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, most of my, my big breakthrough moments have been sort of like, I, when, I, when I first met Ben Folds, and, and we were working on this TV show together, and I guess I knew him a little bit before that, too, but... Um, I mean, he always had this sweet way of making me feel like I could call myself punk rock by doing like the most, like the gentlest of like revolutions. <laughs> like my little internal fuck you was just like so timid, but he's like, yeah, that's really punk rock. And I'm like, yeah, I am punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> One of your major aspirations. Yeah, to be punk, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it sort of became, it's such a good thing to be punk. To be to sort of to question the status quo, and even if you decide to engage with the status quo, at least to question it. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I was I, I read your book, which is have, have people read her book? <laughs> no, you haven't. <laughs> I've gotten the public the publication records. <laughs> I'm like, it's all oh, here's my copy. royalty, seven cents this quarter. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> but but the, the process you describe of they find a creative person who can write a song like Gravity. They proceed to tell that creative person everything you know is wrong and you have to do it our way. They do their best to stamp out the spark. Mm. And then you show the spark and then they're happy again. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it's why people have these discussions about, you know, the, the intersection of art and commerce because... On some level, there, there's a lot of validity to trying to figure out how to package and how to market someone. I mean, that, th there is a science to that. But when you're the product, and especially when you're, you're, 
young and trying to find your own feet, I mean, it's, it's a really confusing time. And so I got lucky that I was able, first of all, I was a little bit older. I was 27 when my first record came out. So I look at someone like Billie Eilish, who's 17 and just released an incredible record. And I just, part of me wants to like scoop her up and protect her from the business because it's- She seems pretty tough. I think she does, she's on her, she's fine. She's punk rock. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to have her in my camp actually. <laughs> But the, uh, well, I, I was, I mean, where to go? Let's go back to the, the new record a little bit. Okay. Um, because one thing that struck me about it is your piano was really down in the mix for most of it. Mm -hmm. Was that a deliberate choice? You know, it was an interesting, I wrote more songs on guitar in this, uh, for this record than I have written in the past. And I played the piano really differently on this record. It was more as like an accoutrement, like it was not the front and center instrument on everything. And so um, that was a really interesting evolution as an artist to kind of step away from needing to be th the meat and potatoes um, and to just, you know, embrace another evolution of this, of this sonic landscape of what I'm making. I mean, T-Bone does that so beautifully, he has this, really organic aesthetic that just arises out of the space around him. I mean, it's, it's a really magical thing to get to work with him. Um, but I remember for the first time recording, really enjoying playing the piano because I was playing it as um, a mode of expression rather than like a, a utilitarian instrument. It wasn't like holding anything together. It was just getting to speak on top of it. So that was um, the first time I'd ever done that because I'm not a prolific player. I have to work really hard at the piano. I, you'll, I'll probably fuck up later when you guys see it. <laughs> like it happens, it's like I'm not that good. So I heard sound check. I'm fine, right. I'm totally fine, but I'm not. <laughs> I mean, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I mean, do, do you write differently on guitar? Yes, because <laughs> I don't really play bar chords. Um, I'm pretty limited on the guitar too. <laughs> so I actually think it's it's interesting, you know, as an artist to kind of be given a sandbox that's kind of limited, and so you sort of see what comes out of um, you know the tools that are right in front of you, and so with the guitar. I'm not virtuosic in any way. I can't, I can't even tell you what the names of the chords are that I'm playing. So I'm just, it's really about feel and, and kind of following my ear. Wow. Well, but I'm thinking about a song like Fire, which is so intricate. Yeah. How did that happen? That was on piano. Okay. That was angry and on piano. <laughs> um, and, and the way I wrote that song was just, um, octaves and in the deepest part of the, I was playing with range a lot on this record too. Like mm -hmm. I sing deeper and lower than I have on other records and, um, and even a little bit probably higher than I have on other records. So I was playing with range and I really was interested in like the belly of the piano and the, I love the percussive element of that the piano can really feel like a beast. And I don't have, I, I li live so much in the mid-range of the piano and so much of my music that I was really excited to kind of go to a, a darker place. So, but then you never know what happens. You write something one way in your demo and then you get into the studio with musicians and all of a sudden there's like mandolins coming out. And <laughs> like, I guess I'm gonna go take a smoke break or whatever. <laughs> I don't smoke. <laughs> You sung about smoking, actually, so I'm glad you don't smoke. Yeah, I don't smoke. Um, the, um, um, tell me about what, what song changed the most in, in, the, uh, in the studio? Um, mm, I think the song called No Such Thing probably changed the most. Um, I wrote it as sort of like an up-tempo um, yeah. I was gonna say like a dance track. I don't really do those, but like <laughs> my version of a dance track, <laughs> like gentle barbecue, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just like get your Zima and just <laughs> grab a veggie dog. Um, yeah, I, 
I wrote it, but it was more of an up-tempo song for me. And then T-Bone just didn't hear it that way. And it totally took a left turn that, frankly, I was kind of fighting for a little while. And then kind of just surrendered to the, to it. And it became the, just this beautiful ballad that it, that, and I love how it lives on the record. But that's not how I envisioned it. Wow. It's got an amazing melody. It jumps oh, all over the place. Thank you. Yeah, I wrote that with Justin Tranter, um, who, if you're not familiar with, he used to be in a band called Semi Precious Weapons, and he writes a lot, and he's an incredible human being and a fierce activist, and he's just so smart and wonderful. And I shared an idea that I had written on a plane that was just on my little garage band, and it was just that piano riff that starts at the top. Do, 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 do. And then he's like, oh, well, I love a melody that runs. He's like, go, girl, go. <laughs> and, like we, and then I was just like, OK, he'd go even higher. So it was, it was fun to embrace the collaborative element of getting new perspectives into the room. And, um, and, and he was really instrumental in that. So, so he, he pushed you higher. He pushed me higher. Actually, yeah. you know, you spoke about range. And I was listening to a lot of your older albums, as well as the new one, and you where you place a song, whether it's down in your chest voice or up in your head voice, seems it, it, it heightens the emotional yeah. center of the song. I mean, that's something you do consciously, it seems. Yeah, definitely. Um, I had an interesting experience with the song I have called Brave that was very, it was right at the breaking point. And when I recorded the song, I mean, the breaking point in my range, and I didn't really know where to place it. And... The nice thing about being in the studio is that you can kind of get as many takes as you need until you nail it, because I was not nailing it. <laughs> and, um, and then it came time to start playing that song live, and I, I did not have the, the faculties to do it. I, I was actually in tears, and like I sang it the first time at a, I can't remember where I was, but I did it live for the first time, and it was a disaster. I was screechy and pitchy, and then, I got the help of a of a vocal coach and and um, named Wendy Parr and she she helped me out in a big way and showed me where to place it and uh, but I tried to lower the the song yeah, I was thing, like maybe I just, just don't down. lower it and it just doesn't have the same emotional resonance it's like you sort of have to be at your breaking point if you're gonna ask other people to be at theirs you know yeah. oh <laughs> somebody write that down. <laughs> Get this bitch a bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> Write that one down too. <laughs> the, the, um, the, uh, limitations sometimes help artists. I think so. I do. I think that that's humanity, right? Like that's uh, that's our vulnerability. And so I think if you're an artist, like being courageous enough to sort of expose your vulnerability is, is the most interesting thing to me, I think. One thing I was also thinking when I was listening through your catalog is early on, I mean, you had gravity really early, right? You had it with your acapella group. Yeah. Um, but that's a song that is personal, but it's, it's big, you know it's bigger than you. It's not a diary. Yeah. It, it's, it's, not, it's not details of my life. It's no. enough to step outside of your own experience. And it seems that that's really essential to your songwriting, is to go to a private place and figure out a way to get the larger perspective. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting, that song that I, I wrote that when I was 18 or 19, and um, just going through my first heartbreak. And I don't think I knew that it was resonant. For anyone other than myself at that time, it felt so deeply personal to me. And that was a great um, teacher, that song, because I really learned that the more you're willing to share your pain and your vulnerability, the more people see themselves and what you have to share. So, But I do think it is interesting, the universality of, of specificity. I think it's the, the times where I've written songs that felt like they were so specific to me. Love Song is another example of that, where I felt like I was writing like a legit diary entry. And, but then somehow it just happened to connect on a larger scale. So I guess everybody's 
and he got asked to write a love song. <laughs> I was like, you can't possibly relate to this, right? <laughs> and then I would get messages online of like, that's about my boyfriend. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it is about your boyfriend. <laughs> you, you don't mind if people uh, put their own stamp on it? Oh my God, I love it. I love it. I, that's why I think music is magic. It's this, it's mercurial. It takes on the shape of whatever you need it to. It's, it's, um, completely reflexive. And I think that, that is, that's why it's magic. That's why it's the universal language, is that it's just it's a mirror for you. And it might show me something completely different than it shows you. But um, that's why I never, I'm not precious about you know, sharing where stories are born, where songs are born, because I also think they just take on so many different lives, if you're lucky. Yeah, there's not one way yeah. to take it. Yeah, for sure. Do you, do you look back sometimes and think, now I know what that song was trying to tell me? Interesting question. Um, sometimes I look back and I, I, I think like with a song like Gravity, I get, um, I, I gain a deeper understanding of the scope of what I was actually dealing with. I mean, my little 18 year old brain was very myopic in that moment and just dealing with Lars, who broke my heart. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> it's just about you, dude. And, and then actually looking at that and, and then seeing the song take on so many different lives over the years and turning about grief and about addiction. And where I realized like, oh, those themes are really, um, are, are really beautiful and, and big themes to be grappling with. But you know, when, you're, when your brain is just piecing it together for the first time, it might feel very, very specific. Yeah, but I think it's nice when you can look back and go, hey, cool. <laughs> Not bad for 18. Not bad for 18. <laughs> the, 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 um, the, the song's bigger than you, in a way, Yeah. once it's out there. Well, I tend to believe that about music in general, and that none of these nothing is really mine anyway. Like I, I'm one of those people who sort of like worships at the altar of music and I, whatever gets chosen to channel through me, it's, I just feel like sort of the lucky vessel for that. But I, I really am like songwriting is church to me. It's, it's my connection to God. It is, um, it's a, like a spiritual practice. So I don't, claim owner, that's why I don't feel precious about any of the material. I mean, I feel precious about the material, but it's, it's coming through so everybody else can have it. It's really not about me. I'm talking to your copyright lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Can you tell him to call me back? <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> can, can I ask you about a deep cut satellite call? Yeah. Um, where did, I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful song, but what, how did that happen? You know, uh, I was dealing with a really troubled fan at a certain point, and um, and I wrote this song. Th this person sort of became um, a, a representative of this community of of sort of misfit hearts running around out there. Just someone that was so clearly lost and misunderstood, and um, like dangerously lost. And uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of offer something. And that was kind of the best I could do. I, it, it's, it was such an interesting song to write because it felt, I was reading, I was reading this book on the cosmos at the time and um, talking a lot about, you know, space and, and um, the earth and its relationship to each other and the idea that we would just sort of send something up and hope it kind of finds a home somewhere. So that was that, was that song. It's hard to sing, actually, that one. <laughs> Turns out, yeah. <laughs> it, has, it has its own sound world, too. That the yeah. production of it is very different for you. Yeah, yeah, that was um, off the blessed unrest where I was really seeking new sonic information and playing a lot with um, electronic sounds and um, you know trying to 
be my own version of Radiohead. <laughs> like the barbecue version of Radiohead. <laughs> Everybody wants to be Radiohead. I know. <gasps> Radio, Radiohead is the great roar shock of, I know. <laughs> of, of, of musicians especially. Totally. Because they see. It's so, untouchable, yeah. Um, the, um, tell me about St. Honesty on the new album you wrote with Laurie McKenna. Yes. Um, Do you know Laurie McKenna? If you don't, well, you have yeah, to I was going to ask you to talk about her. Laurie McKenna is um, an incredible singer-songwriter who has written lots of wonderful songs over the years for lots of different artists, but is also a, a really beautiful singer and, and songwriter herself. Um, and I got exposed to her music through a friend of mine at Waitress, our, our guitar player, Meg Tui, used to play in her band. They're from Massachusetts. Lori has got five kids, lives with her high school sweetheart in her house in Massachusetts, and like happy as a clam, the nicest woman you'll ever meet in your life, and writes the most devastating <laughs> songs that will rip your heart into a thousand trillion pieces. I'm like, girl. And she's like, yeah, I wrote that while I was watching an episode of Modern Family. <laughs> I'm like, this is not real. But um, she is remarkable, and um, I just, we had this incredible chemistry where I sat down in a studio with her in Nashville for two days, and I ended up with four songs, and they just, they just flowed. It was the fastest writing I've ever done. And St. Honesty, um, I had started while I was visiting my boyfriend. He was working on a show in LA, and I was out in, in his apartment and playing on the guitar, and I started writing this this song about the, the, the truth will set you free, that in relationship to each other, you know, in a love relationship or otherwise, that the only thing that gets you further down the path is truth. And it might be the hardest thing you can ever do, but that feels like a really sacred offering to me. Um, and so I brought that to her and then in like an hour we had finished this song and it became my favorite song on the record. And um, one of the reasons I love it so much on the record is that with the gentle wisdom of T-Bone, I got encouraged to kind of embrace my own musicianship and uh, record live with the band. I usually always did that sequentially where I would, they would go in and then I would go in and play the piano because I was always afraid I would make a mistake. and. That whole record process so became not about perfection, and it just became about capturing a moment in time. And so I sat at the piano and sang with the microphone right next to me, and um, we just played the song down a few times, and then we chose our favorite take. So that's just, wow. a, that's just a one shot, yeah. Mm. So I'm really, I'm happy with that, because as an artist, I feel like it's important to continue to push yourself to be try the harder thing, you know, the, the more exposed thing. And there are mistakes on there, and you hear breath, and it's, it's imperfect, but that's kind of what I love about it. I didn't, I didn't realize it was one take. That's yeah, amazing. yeah. It's, it's also such a soul song. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to ask you about, you go through so many eras in your music, because, like, you go all the way back to the 50s, yeah. but then, you know, Brave is like a, you know, 2000s banger. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> a bop, as they say. A bop. <laughs> Yeah. Um, did, did you do, do you think about you know being multi generational in a way in your music? I think it's something I may have sort of always done subconsciously. Um, just the range of what I love is so vast and varied, but I always come back to those kind of the the tried and true staples of of music, the pillars of music. Um, what are those? I mean, for me, it's people like. Carol King and Elton John and Billy Joel and Paul Simon and Joni Mitchell and um, Etta James, Ray Charles, uh, Nina Simone. These are the people that I listen to all the time. Um, and but I do think I actually. It's funny that as you mentioned that I think one of the things that made me think about writing Saint Honesty was working on She Used to Be Mine because I I got reacquainted with writing a 6-8 ballad, you know, like a, you know, a sort of soul song. And, and uh, so I think I wanted to include that on the record in, in some way. So that's a little connecting the dots. 
Um, I actually wanted to ask about waitress because musical theater is harder than being a rock and roll performer, isn't it? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're in the wrong place, some dancer's gonna kick you. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You, I mean yeah. was that, that must have been an incredible amount of discipline. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I really think my, the level of respect and admiration I have for the theatrical community is, is immense. I mean, they're doing stuff that is so much harder and so they make so much less money than most <laughs> like they're just you it's so it's so difficult to do the same thing eight times a week and to make it feel fresh and alive and the the toll it takes on your body and um and your and your psyche it's just it's an incredible undertaking and they do it so beautifully so much of the time it's just incredible um but yeah it's also it's really um a team sport. And so that I really responded to that. I think there's something about being an artist that for me feels a little bit lonely. It's like no matter what you do, even if you've been with your band for 20 years, it's like there's still just a little bit of um, an isolation booth that travels with you as the artist. And I don't, and I did not find that in theater at all. I felt very much like we were a family and we were a team, even, I mean, in the creative process and beyond. It was like my community of collaborators and creators and then my community of collaborators and creators as, as performers on stage. So I really loved that. Wow. And we all got matching onesies, so. <laughs> we don't do that in music business as much as you think we do. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine at the Grammys they hand out like best new artist onesies? <laughs> I like this. Next year. Write it down. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely next year. Yeah. Um, um, <clears throat> you, you're, tell me about your little voice project, which is called a dramedy, which is great because it covers everything. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you don't have to commit. I know. <laughs> I know. I think we we're trying to give ourselves a little leeway. Um, yeah, again, I'm working with my beloved Jesse Nelson from Waitress, and, um, and uh, we're working with J.J. Abrams and his company Bad Robot, and Apple is, is launching the show on their new network, and um, I basically, the story of it is that I met J.J. a few years ago, and um, he asked if I wanted to ever come in, if I was in L.A., if I wanted to come in for breakfast at Bad Robot, and I was like, sure. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> and I went in and we had eggs and, and um, sat in their gorgeous office in Santa Monica. And I literally had no idea what I was doing there. I was like, what is, what could this possibly be? And um, I had just gotten back from the Women's March and his wife, Katie, was in, was in the offices as well. And we talked about that. And she and their daughter had just come back. And, and then, you know, the meeting goes on and we're just chatting. And I'm thinking, oh, this is just like, social and he, whatever, I'm gonna be friends with JJ now, this is awesome. <laughs> um, and then he said, you know, do you, have you ever thought about doing anything in television? And I was like, no, <laughs> I, I absolutely have not. Um, but he's like, well, you know, would you? Like, what would that, what do you think that would be? And the first thing that came to my mind was um, a show JJ created, uh, I guess, in the, late 90s or early 2000s called Felicity with Carrie Russell, right? <laughs> Carrie Russell of Waitress. Carrie Russell, I know. I still haven't met her. I'm a, like a little afraid. I know. <laughs> I'm like a little afraid to meet her because I'll probably like pass out on the floor. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, I probably would. I'm like sweating thinking about it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, so I was just a huge fan of that show, and I loved it, and I um, and I thought it would be so interesting, you know, to make a show in a contemporary setting that was about a young woman finding her voice, and um, you know, what if Felicity was a songwriter essentially? And um, we went to Jesse, and she came on board, and we all started kind of like dreaming up the world of little voice. We decided to call it little voice as a little tip of the hat to that kind of chapter in my life. And then I just shared this story recently is that our, our little theme song for the show is actually a song that I started writing when I was 
24, 25, going through the process of writing music for um, the first record. And I, I had a dream about writing this song. And I woke up and I wrote this song and I was like, oh, thank you. It's like a return to myself. I was already totally discombobulated by the industry. And, um, and I wrote this song and I took it to my producer and he's like, I just, I don't think it's probably good enough for the record. And then, so I'm gutted, but I just, I like fight to still call the record Little Voice because it meant a lot to me. But all those years later, that little song has like stayed intact and the whole time it was meant to live now, which I think is the coolest thing in the world. And so it, it really um, elicits all of those feelings I was feeling at that age. And so I love that that song gets a second, a second chance. Is it, me too. I want to hear it. Yeah. Um, is is the show autobiographical? I mean, no. It's more. It, it would be really limiting to sort of just tell my story, which I don't. I don't really feel. I mean, I wrote a book about it, so <laughs> um, it's more fun to get to sort of play. I mean, I'm inundated with stories of my entire community of artist friends, and um, there's so much to see and know about, you know, that, that age is so fertile for, for, you're just, you're being told you're an adult for the first time and you're such a mess. <laughs> and then, and, and all those times you sort of take, take those chances and take those risks to sort of step into your bigger self and, and where you, where you fly and where you fall. So it's just a really, it's a fun time to get to play with and, um, there will be some stuff that feels like it's mine, but moreover, we're sort of creating something, a new world for Bess. Her name is Bess. Wow. Is it, is it what's, what, how, do you have a number of episodes to fill or? Yeah, 10 episodes in the first season. And um, we're in the writing, we're in the sort of like pre-production mode. We're writing and um, kind of getting things together, casting, all that fun stuff. All that fun stuff. Yeah. Is there a deadline? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Good, go get it done. Uh -huh. I never get anything done without a deadline. Yeah, I know. It's crazy, <laughs> huh? Deadlines. <laughs> They're fun. <laughs> I don't know when it's happening, so well, I would tell you if I did, but I don't. <laughs> well, you know it's there. I know it's there. <clears throat> um, it, it, well, uh, what's, what else is in the archives? I mean, like August Moon, I mean, you have all these songs out there. Deep cut, thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, in a perfect world, you mean in relationship to the show? Well, also just in general. In general. Well, honey, I got one more record on my, on my record label contract, so I'm pulling all out. I'm not bringing them all out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, sometimes what I've found in, in my life as a songwriter is that sometimes songs are bridges. They're just taking you from one place to the next. And um, yeah, so I've got my, my little suitcase full of songs and I don't know where they're gonna live yet. You know, I, I guess I'm gonna, I mean, every once in a while you get a little voice story where like something comes out of the archives that way, but I don't know. I don't have place, places set for the other ones yet. Do you have intense quality control? Yeah. Maybe? I'm not, the, I, I definitely am like, I've written some pretty bad songs that nobody needs to hear, <laughs> like for a reason. Yeah, we won't go into that. Okay. <laughs> There's plenty mentions, of YouTube Your, your book mentions the pop reggae love song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but your, your songs are really crafted. I mean, they're not, um, you, you think about the balance of hook and chorus and verse and, yeah, I think, you know, the, all those writers I mentioned, that was kind of embedded in, it's important to me, the craft of songwriting. I mean, it's something that annoys me, frankly, about when people are lazy about songwriting. Like, you can't just, if you repeat something over and over again that doesn't make it a good hook, it just means it's repetitive and you're <laughs> drilling it into my brain. So I just, I think that, like, again, that's a little bit of, like, the magic of music where sometimes you know, you're trying to sort of uncover it, what's already there. But um, I'm a big believer in you sort of like have to listen to the song because the song is sort of asking to be, um, you know, manifested in some way. So I think, and sometimes I get it right and sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes I listen back and I'm like, wow, 
Nice try. Swing and a miss, Borales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I once talked to Bruce Springsteen, and he said it was hard for him to tell a good song from bad once he had the E Street Band playing them because they all sounded so good. Yeah. Um, but uh, and um, you you have you have your own quality control. You have your own. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I d did you see his show? Yeah. <sighs> wow. That was like going to church. That was amazing. Um, yeah, I do. I think that. You know, we have to be willing to, to share the good ideas and the bad ideas, but I, I really feel like when a song is right, it, it, it has a special little shimmer to it, and those are the ones that usually end up on the record. Do you, do you know immediately? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes I think I know and I'm wrong. <laughs> like, this is a hit, and it's like, absolutely not. <laughs> um, but I, you know, there's... It's a relationship. I mean, there's songs that I, that I have that I really learned to love that I didn't love at the time or songs that like, have taught me so much over the years. Um, well, can you talk about one? Um, like, I think Love Song was a little bit, I mean, to pick one that you might know, it's like Love Song is a song that taught me a lot. Um, because it came out of this very like unbridled, kind of unexamined place in myself. I really wasn't like trying to craft something. I was trying to return to something. I was so just sort of like beat up by the process and feeling so disassociated from my, my source, capital S, as Queen Oprah says. <laughs> um, and I really felt like it was, it was a return to something, and then, then I love that that song continues to be a return to the audience, really, for me. So I might get a little bored singing that song, you know, if I were to do it in my bedroom, which I don't have a piano in my bedroom, but if I did. Um, <laughs> but I, I, might, I, I probably wouldn't sing that song by myself at home, but I love singing that song with and for people because it's, it's just like this little invitation to return to each other. Well, it's also... Uh... Defiant, yeah, which is a good punk story. rock. Punk rock, <laughs> I've heard of that. <laughs> you know, it also seems like you, you, I mean, that song maybe inadvertently, but later with songs like Brave and Armor, you're 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 saying, "Do it, girl," basically. Yeah, I think that there's been an interesting sort of shift of focus, and I feel more <clears throat> interested in being reflexive myself like I would rather be an artist that sort of amplifies a message I think I used to write songs for myself so much more than I do now I wrote songs that I needed to hear because they were a pep talk for me they were solving something inside of myself and now I'm really interested in writing songs that live in that space but also encourage other people to kind of dip into the into their sort of power seat as well especially, you know, our, the young generation that still feels like they need permission to be, to feel strong. So I think that I, I try to do that as much as I can. Well, so I would have loved that too. And you've solved all of your own problems by now. I'm a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a fucking mess. Let me be done. <laughs> I'm in therapy once a week for eight years, y'all. I am not, I don't have anything figured out. Don't you dare think I do. <laughs> Um, but I sure did wear blue. <laughs> <laughs> you said you figured that out. I had figured that out. I hired someone to help me figure that out, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to see here, folks. <laughs> um, do, do, you have, do you have songs that are deep cuts that you wish more people showed the love to? Um... I had a song on my on my second record um, called Basket Case that I really loved. I literally die happy right now. <laughs> um, and I just really I loved that song. I wrote it about my my record label, my liaison to the label, my A and R guy, who got 
let go from the label and I was just devastated and just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried and thought I would never get over it. And um, he's fine and he's, so he didn't <laughs> die, but I wrote the song as if he like had died. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I loved, I loved that song and I was really inspired by Bonnie Vare at the time. So I was like, yeah, it was a really sweet little kind of melancholy chapter in my life. So I love that song. There's probably others in there somewhere. I had an EP that Ben Folds produced. Um, <clears throat> oh, you guys know those too. <laughs> you're, you're literally trying to kill me. Um, um, and we had a couple of songs. I had a song on there called Lie to Me that I thought that people, that, and I was like, oh my God, get ready, Borellis. You're getting into the alternative market. <laughs> Your life's gonna change. You're gonna wear eyeliner now. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> I told like 10 copies of that whole record and moved on with my life. It's fine. Yeah, but it streamed 25. It, st it streamed 25. <laughs> True. Do, do you think about hits? I mean, do you think about the, the, the market? I mean, I would be lying if I said it doesn't, it doesn't come into your consciousness, but I, but I do think that any time I've ever tried to orient towards success in that way, or like that sort of conventional understanding of it, it's just, that's, no, this is not, <laughs> that's not my, my resonance. It just doesn't, it, it always feels false to me in some way. So, um, yeah, I think, I, I think about it, but I've learned enough to know that that isn't what makes good music. And I think the thing that I really feel proud of is that I, I look back on my catalog and um, I really stand behind everything that, that was put out. I really love the music that I've made. And so um, I, don't, I don't ever go back and go, boy, I really, I sold out for that or something. I just. I was, I was really firm in, in my beliefs you know, all along the way yeah. for the most part. Well, I mean, you, you wrote in your book about Brave that you were worried a little bit about it being too pop. Totally. But then, you, then it seems like you realize you wrote an anthem and it should be Well, and big. writing it with Jack Antonoff, who like his, his frequency is like, it's a stadium. Like that's sort of like, he just is this incredible, I think I refer to him as an amplifier. Like he is, <laughs> he's the guy that's gonna like turn up the wattage and it somehow doesn't, he doesn't sacrifice any of that heart or that intimacy. He just has a way of framing the message to make it feel bigger. And yeah. so, um, yeah, that song has become so precious to me. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you choose collaborators? I mean, is it, social turns into musical? Sometimes, like that's how I met Jack is through um, Sarah Quinn of Tegan and Sarah and, um, and she and Jack were really close and they'd written together and were friends and she's like, I think you'd just love him and, and I immediately loved him and first of all did what I always do and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna fall in love with him, aren't I? <laughs> and then I we, <laughs> thankfully we were just always friends but um, I, I just, I just, loved him, his, his sort of idiosyncrasies and his eccentric nature and his total like wild heart. He just is so interested in making um, the unheard feel heard and, and he does that with every artist that he collaborates with. And, I, and then other collaborators, sometimes you know somebody comes highly recommended and for whatever reason it just doesn't flourish in the creative space. Um, and other times, like with Lori, I just knew I was a fan of her work, but I didn't know if we would actually have chemistry. And then it was a great surprise to know that like, I fell in love with her too. Not in that way, but <laughs> for a minute, I was like, oh, I'm gonna fall in love with you. <laughs> just my process. <laughs> well, you're gonna do that musical with Jennifer Nettles called Lesbians. Called Lesbians, yeah. So <laughs> that was our first like a foray. <laughs> Didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah, that one's a good one. That's good to be in the trunk songs, those, those ones. <laughs> but I love Jennifer, and she's a spitfire. And I don't think I ever would have even considered writing songs for a musical if it hadn't been for her. 
she was just, she was gung-ho, and she's like, we're going to do this. You and me, we're going to sit down and write a musical. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then we started down the path, and then, of course, life takes you in different directions. And, um, but it was really fun to kind of, like, get serious about, she's the most ambitious person, and she has so much fire. And it was really good for me to get kind of, like, taught by a sister that way, where she was like, let me show you your fire. And I was like, okay. <laughs> now it's the opening cut on your album. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the silent track at the end if you keep listening. <laughs> you get to the theme from Lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. let's, see, let's see if it's backward mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, we, we're going to do some Q&A. You guys can ask some questions, too. Um, Exciting. The, uh, there's microphones there and there. Um, and you can line up and keep them short so everybody can get, <laughs> get, get a few words in. Um, short but, and, and we, we also we also consulted the interwebs. Uh, <gasps> oh, great. And, uh, I love, I've heard of that. Um, so, so <laughs> it's really catching on, huh, this internet thing? <laughs> the intertubes, whatever it's called. <laughs> the, uh, um, so I, I have a pocket full of questions from there, too. Okay, great. Um, but go ahead. Oh. Hi. Hi. Um, your music means a lot to me. We had You Matter to me at our wedding. And I tried to invite you, but you were busy. <laughs> Where did you send it? <laughs> I asked you in person. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I, but when I met you, I didn't have words, so I have words now. Oh, so you asked me telepathically, and you're surprised <laughs> I didn't no, go? I just was like on a poster. <laughs> well, happy, happy marriage. Thank you. you. He let me come by myself from DC because he, there was only one ticket. So Aww, <laughs> he's a good so man. That I'm man. so glad you're Mine. here. Thank you. Um, so you matter to me is a huge song in our life, and um, can you talk to me about the process of writing that one and just? kind of how it came to fruition? Yeah, so You Matter to Me is a song from Waitress, and um, I really was writing for the scene that um, is between Jenna and the love interest, Dr. Pometer. And there was, a, there was a line in the screenplay, actually, um, that Adrian Shelley wrote, and, and it said, I hope you become addicted, baby. I hope you become addicted to saying things and having them matter to someone. I said in a southern accent for you. <laughs> um, and that idea of, because their relationship was really not about falling in love with each other. It was about being seen. And I thought that that was such a delicate way to sort of offer someone a form of love without having it be this big sort of rom-com I love you, a declaration. It was, more, it was softer than that. Um, so that's where that song came from, and it's, it's one of my favorites in the show. Thank, Thank you. you. We got to do a um, Persian sugar ceremony with it. I don't know if you're familiar with um, your family holds a scarf above you, and you rub sugar to represent like having a sweet life. So I love my that. friends sang it, and then we did that. So I love that. Thank you for your Thank music. you for sharing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, you're literally like amazing and so down to earth, and that's incredible. And like, I want to be your best friend. Just <laughs> FYI, I'll probably stalk you on Instagram and ask you to be my best friend. Um, can you talk about working with John Legend and yeah. Brandon Victor Dixon and the Jesus Christ Superstar, in which you were absolutely phenomenal? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, it was an extraordinary experience um, that I think also was the product of being involved with Waitress and, and getting familiarizing myself with the Broadway community. Um, I mean, I have never, it was such a lovely creative experience. It was so, we were so nurtured and felt so safe in the room. Everyone, I mean, John was, an incredible leader doing this like unimaginable thing, like stepping out into that role on that kind of scope and scale. And he was so, uh, he is unflappable. I've never seen somebody, he's just cool as a cucumber all the time. He is 
totally Jesus. <laughs> and he just, I mean, he just was awesome. And he was so generous with everyone and, and was really gracious and lovely. And, and Brandon is this like otherworldly triple threat of, of a craftsman and, um, and really hyper intellectual and really studied. And um, he was so sweet and so lovely to work with. Um, yeah, I, I just couldn't have asked for a better, I mean, from, from our executives down to every dancer, every, like, we felt like we were doing the musical theater Super Bowl. <laughs> like, we were all so excited to get to launch and, and um, do this one thing together. And, and it was really a remarkable experience. And yeah, I'm really grateful. And John wasn't nervous, so I felt like I don't have any business being nervous, because if Jesus ain't freaking out. <laughs> I got two songs, get her done, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he's on your album. Yeah, and he's on my album, yeah. He he's, he's, uh, sings on a song I have that I also wrote with Lori McKenna called A Safe Place to Land, which was a tiny tip of the hat to Waitress, because <laughs> there's a song in the show called Soft Place to Land. Um, but Lori and I were in, in Nashville together when there was um, sort of the first images of the, the border crisis. And, uh, children being taken away from their families and um, the first audio of those children on the phone call and crying and asking to go home and um, it was unimaginable and so we sat in the studio and I just cried and cried and and then we wrote the song about you know that idea that can we at least offer each other safe harbor that you know knowing how difficult nobody leaves you know, nobody leaves their house if it's if it's great. Nobody's carrying their children hundreds of miles or thousands of miles because things are really good at home. So um, that idea that we want to just continue to be safe harbor, and John is such a beautiful activist and advocate for all these causes, and um, all the proceeds to that song go to the ACLU. So that's... Yeah. <laughs> It's so fun to listen to you speak. You have, you're just, you're amazing. And I was saying to my husband that you don't know it, but we've hung out a lot recently. I saw you at Waitress. I came to the karaoke night. Um, but um, it's, it's amazing to listen to you, and I love everything that you're saying. Thanks. It's hard to choose a favorite, but probably my favorite song of yours is Bright Lights and Cityscapes. Could you oh, tell thank us a you. about that one? Thank you. Yeah. Um, that song just sort of... Um, came out of, I was getting ready to go into the studio with Ben Folds, and um, I wasn't ready to make a full record, so it was just, maybe can we make a little patchwork quilt of, of the few songs that had arisen? And I think I just, it's about writing about the idea that, you know, it's about sorrow, and, and watching someone kind of step away knowing that what they're stepping onto is not solid ground. And um, I think it's, it's something that I've experienced in my life in a lot of different forms. And, um, and I liked the meditative kind of quality of that. The, rep the repetitious right hand was just very like simple and soothing. And um, yeah, it's another sad song. <laughs> so beautiful. My Thank you so Thank much. You. Go ahead. I wonder if you could talk about how they approached you about taking over the lead of Waitress what your appre apprehensions and fears were yeah. and how it turned out. They were many, and they were robust. <laughs> um, I, you know, the way I describe this moment in time is that basically when we got word to so Jesse Mueller, who was our original leading lady and extraordinarily talented, she's a really, really a special, um, a special, special performer. Um, when, she, when her contract had finished and she was gonna move on, I just experienced this girl inside me who like raised her hand. That's, how, that's kind of just how it felt to me. And there was just this part of me, and my creative, my collaborators, Diane Paulus, our director, and Jesse, and Lauren Letero, and Nadia, like all the, all, this is my coven at this point. <laughs> you know, everyone's always you know, they would like throw it out there as a little tease, like, well, maybe you would, and it was always like, oh my God, I could never. And then when the time came, I just felt that impulse to just consider it. 
And then I got so much love and so much nourishment from them and encouraging me to do it. And, and I had learned, I've learned over the last like probably five or six years of my life is that when you feel really fearful about something, it usually means you gotta go do it. Like that's where the teacher is hiding, that's what, you know, that's where the growth is. Um, so I knew I was really scared and there was also some little tug inside me that wanted to, to make me go towards it. So I got some wonderful support and then kind of took the leap and it was, I'm so grateful that I did. It was really, really a magical time. Go ahead. Hi, huge fan. Thanks. I'm pretty confident 85% of those streams are for me. <laughs> um, Manhattan is one of my favorite songs in the entire world. Help me get through a really bad breakup. And I want to ask what, if any role does New York play in your music? Oh my God, it's like my, soul sister this city I just I feel like I got to New York and I was like oh I've been here the whole time like I just <laughs> I didn't realize I'd been living in the wrong state um I yeah I mean New York was incredibly instrumental especially in my third record The Blessed Unrest because it, it was it was the landscape of that chapter in my life I wrote a lot of those songs here I recorded all of those songs here. So the, the city was a huge, a huge character in my life and, and remains that way. Um, and I think there is just, um, I mean, everyone's so cliche to, for people to talk about the energy of New York City, but I think it is, it's the most, um, it's dense and it's complicated and it's messy and it's hard and it just feels the most like life to me. It just feels the most real to me because it's not particularly charming all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it can be, it's, that's also the magic of New York is that it's the most magical place. But um, I just find it to be incredibly authentic. So yeah, it, it inspires me to sort of, you know, turn into corners of myself that I may not have before. Go ahead. Hi, so you've um, talked a little bit about collaborating with other singers and songwriters, and I was wondering, because you can do both writing lyrics and writing the melodies, when you meet with people like Jack Antonoff, do you have an idea in mind for what you wanna write, or does it come together from you? It's interesting, so it's different for everybody, and every writer comes kind of with a different approach. One of the things I loved about working with Jack is that he was so adamant about, he's like, you, you write great lyrics, you don't need me for anything. And, and it was like, he gave me permission to just like go tell my story. And, um, and we basically just like flipped through little sound bite ideas that he had just, he had all these little clips of songs that were seedlings. And then I would just feel myself respond to one or another, you know, a handful of them, and then you kind of like follow down the path and see what comes out. Um, but like for some, with someone like Lori, it was seamless. Like the lyrical exchange was so seamless that I found that I didn't, I'm usually like a real brat about that where I feel like I have to say all the words or else it's not my song. And then, but for some reason with Lori, it was just really easy. So I think the chemistry is just, it kind of dependent upon the players. Um, we got time for one more because we get to hear you play. All right. Um, but last one. Hi. Hey, girl. <laughs> this um, is Camille. Tell them how many times you've seen Waitress. Uh, 53. <laughs> 53 times. I'm not, I'm not the most, though. I'm not. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good friend to the show. We love you. Um, but so I'm um, trying to be a writer, and I was just wondering how you deal with like self doubt and like whether like anything you write or like create is something that like other people want to hear. Like how yeah. you wrestle with that. Okay. Well, I'm going to make you change your statement. So you are a writer, right? Let me hear you. I'm a writer. <laughs> You're a writer. At a girl. <laughs> you might be a new writer, but you're a writer. Um, oh, man, I think the best teacher is experience. I mean, it's just about being willing to 
be bad in front of people <laughs> because it's just, there's no reason you would be as good as you will be yet. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you just have to be willing to begin somewhere and start telling your story. And um, I, I believe every person has a, a story that's worth hearing and you're gonna learn how best to tell your story. And um, I really applaud you getting out there and, and trying something new because it's hard. And But there's amazing teachers out there too and resources. And um, I love this book called The War of Art. Have you heard of this book? Stephen Pressfield, go get it. Um, and he talks a lot about like, if you want to be a writer, you fucking sit down and write. Like that, you don't, you don't, you know, there's a lot of this kind of like the mythology of being an artist and um, the, the romance of like bourbon clinking in a glass and like a fucking like, get out of here with that. You want to be a writer, like you got to sit down. It's hard um, in whatever form, whatever you're doing, you know, it takes work to sort of hone your craft, but you got to start somewhere, so. Amen to a new writer. Hey, Camille. <laughs> anyway, th thank you. Um, you're going to play some songs for us. I'm going to disappear. Okay. Um, but yeah. thank you so thank much. You. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to sit over here now. <laughs> So I was gonna just play um, some of my, some of the ones that we might all know because it's it's really really fun, if you know it, to just to sing along and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with this one because it's high. You can be amazing. You could turn a phrase into a weapon or a drug. You can be the outcast or be the backlash of somebody's lack of love. Or you can start speaking up Nothing's gonna hurt you the way the words do When they set beneath your skin Kept on the inside and no sunlight Sometimes a shadow wins But I wonder what would happen if you say What you wanna say And let the words fall out Honestly Say and let the words fall out. 
None of you sang along remotely. I really thought that was going to be like a different thing. And you guys, you guys were like, mm hmm. Uh -huh, what happened then? Okay. Thank you for leaving me high and dry. Um, <laughs> so I've only uh, done this song a handful of times live, but it was it was a cornerstone song for the for the creation of the new record. We talked about it a little bit, and I wrote it when I got back from the the women's march, and it's about you know all my sisters and all our friends and the new feminist movement. It's called Armor. <laughs> Let it begin, let Adam in Step one, original sin Underneath the leaves, Adam found Eve Both of them found something sweet under the apple tree Then it was over, roads divide Step two, learning how to lie Let me ask a question to present day How the hell did Eve end up with all the damn blame? All the damn blame To all the dirty looks The kitty cat calls To the ones who try and throw us up against the back walls Let me tell you something you'll understand Only the little boys tell you they're a big man To all my sisters And all our friends We have to thank them Please Strength me Blessed with an enemy, oh my, 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 my armor comes from you. You made me try, 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 try harder. Oh, it's all I ever do, ever do. Oh no, no, my, 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 my armor comes from you. You make me stronger, stronger. Now hand me my armor. Forgettable, incredible ones who came before me Brought poetry, brought science Sowed quiet seeds of self-reliance Bloomed in me, so oh, here I am You think I am high and mighty, mister Wait till you meet my little sister Oh, my, 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 my armor comes from you you made me try, 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 try harder Oh, it's all I ever do, ever do Oh, no, no, my, 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 my armor comes from you You make me stronger, stronger Hand me my armor Goddamn seed, you don't scare me. I am of the earth, so tired of your empire. Blind men only set the world on fire. Sad you can't see it. You brought the flame, and here comes the phoenix. You make me try. Stronger, stronger
Thank you. Um, thank you. You've been so unbelievably lovely. I'm going to do one more song for you, and um, this is the song that was my um, my invitation into the world of Waitress. It's the first song that I wrote for the show, and it's a song that has kind of gone on to have a life outside of the show in a way that was unfathomable to me. So um, I'm really amazed and grateful to be a part of the journey of this song in the world, and uh, it's called She Used to Be Mine. It's not simple to say Most days I don't recognize me With these shoes and this apron That place and its patrons I've taken more than I gave them It's not easy to know I'm not anything like I used to be Although it's true I was never Attention sweet Center I still remember That girl She's Imperfect But she tries She is Good But she lies She is Hard She is broken and won't ask for help. She is messy, but she's kind. She is lonely most of the time. She is all of this mixed up and baked in a beautiful pie. She is gone, but she used to be mine And it's not what I asked for Sometimes life just slips in through a back door And carves out a person that makes you believe it's all true now I've got you And you're not what I asked for If I'm honest, I know I would give it all back For a chance to start over Rewrite an ending or two For the girl But who learns how to toughen up when she's bruised And gets used by a man who can't love And then she'll get stuck and be scared Of the life that's inside her Growing stronger each day Till it finally reminds her To fight just a little
Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming.